Okay then. So hi everyone, my name's Mike George. I'm a fifth year medical student intercalating at Liverpool. So I've just finished fourth year in which we did our finals uh, and I'm now onto an MRS taking a year out from medicine. But today I have the uh, task of talking to you about uh, endocrinology. And so what I thought I'd focus the session on is some quite common things that are probably exam favorites and that includes thyroid disease. And then a couple key conditions of the adrenal glands. Given the time limitations, I'm afraid it won't quite be exhaustive, but I'll point you in the right direction for some extra bits and bobs uh, to keep you busy with. Uh, just to let you know, feel free to interrupt, raise a hand or send any questions through the chat function. Um, I've got quite a lot of going on on my screen at the moment, uh, so I'll do my very best to keep an eye on it. Uh, if not, we'll have a moment at the end of the session to talk over any questions anyway. Okay. Oh, and... Please uh, forgive the dodgy, excuse me, the dodgy moustache. Uh, I'm sporting it for November. So what are we going to cover then? So we're going to cover disorders of the thyroid gland, namely hyper and hypothyroidism. We're going to cover Cushing's disease and Cushing syndrome and Addison's disease with regards to adrenal pathology. And we're going to end with a couple MCQs. As promised, a couple of things to think about that I'm afraid we won't touch on are other uh, diseases within the adrenal glands, one of which would be hyperaldosteronism uh, and more specifically Conn syndrome, pheochromocytomas, uh, be aware of pituitary hormone abnormalities, for example, your ADH and growth hormone uh, derangements, and then finally metabolic endocrinology as well, things like diabetes. So First, if we start with a case then. So a lady presents to you with weight loss, shaking, palpitations, irritability, and sweating. On history of presenting complaint, you find that she's had these symptoms for a number of months and they've been getting progressively worse. She's usually in good health. She's not on any regular medications and she has a daughter with a history of thyroid disease. She can't elaborate any more than the daughter has an enlarged thyroid. She, this lady is a smoker, uh, excuse me, a non-smoker and drinks 10 units of alcohol per week. And on review of symptoms, you find she has a little bit of diarrhea and her periods have been lighter than usual. So it's good to have a little think about what, what's going through your mind based on this history. Now, of course, we're in an endocrine system, uh, session and we've talked a little bit about the thyroid already. Now, if you were to go on and examine this lady, I think it would be sensible to examine her thyroid. So you start with inspection. This lady's slightly sweaty. She seems anxious at rest and she's restless. She has a staring expression with prominent eyes. On palpation of the thyroid gland, you note a firm and smooth enlargement, which moves on swallowing. You auscultate a brewery, so turbulent blood throw, flow through the thyroid. And on percussion, there's no evidence of retrosternal extension meaning the thyroid doesn't seem to be extending downwards down the neck. You do some special tests. You look at her eyelids and you note lid lag with exophthalmos and further lid retraction. So before we discuss the kind of details of this case, I just want to take a moment to think about the thyroid gland itself. So we all know that the thyroid gland is an endocrine gland. It's made up of two lobes with a central isthmus and it's located at the center of the neck around C5 to T1 um, level in the, in the vertebra. The function of the thyroid gland is to secre secrete thyroid hormone. So the thyroid gland itself is stimulated on a hypothalamic pituitary axis. The hypothalamus secretes TRH, which stimulates the pituitary to, stim to release TSH. And then that stimulates the thyroid gland to secrete the thyroid hormones T3, the active form, and T4. Now, the thyroid gland itself and the hormones it secretes are particularly important in managing growth development, but probably most importantly is your basal metabolic rate. And that's what I want you to bear in mind when we think about this lady's symptoms and when we think about the general symptoms of different disorders of the thyroid. So hyperthyroidism. That's what this lady is presenting with. Hyperthyroidism refers to excessive secretion of thyroid hormones from the thyroid gland. Now, there are a number of causes to be aware of. First, you have Graves' disease. 
So Graves disease is the most common cause of thyroid disease in the developed world, typically accounts for about two thirds of cases, and it's underpinned by stimulatory binding of autoantibodies to G protein coupled receptors on the thyroid gland. This over time results in smooth thyroid enlargement and increased secretion of thyroid hormone. And there are a number of key features of Graves disease that will be distinguishable in a question which we'll come to discuss in just a moment. Other causes include a toxic multinodular goiter. So this refers to the presence of multiple nodules within the gland, which have the ability to secrete thyroid hormone. You have a toxic adenoma, which refers to a single thyroid secreting adenoma or a single thyroid secreting nodule. And you also have medication uh, and exogenous causes. There are a number of different medications to be thinking about. Firstly, it is possible to give thyroid hormone as a medication itself. And it's typically reserved for patients with hypothyroidism, meaning a low level of thyroid hormones. It is possible to overdose someone with that, or they may to be taking too large a dose or too frequently, which could lead to a state of hyperthyroidism. Other medications to be aware of include amiodarone and lithium, both of which interact with the thyroid gland. It is worth being aware, however, that these two medications are far, far more common to cause hypothyroidism. There are other pituitary causes, for example, uh, of hyperthyroidism where you'd have an excessive secretion of TSH, and that would lead to increased stimulation of the gland. And there are a couple of more quirky syndromes in which you can have ectopic thyroid tissue deposition. One example would be struma ovarii, which is a condition in which you have thyroid tissue de deposition within the ovaries, and that secretes thyroid hormone. Now, these conditions are much less likely to be uh, true of this lady. And when you're thinking about differentials for hyperthyroidism, they should be far lower down your list, but worth, worth thinking about. The final differential, which I'm going to briefly mention is De Quiven's thyroiditis. De Quiven's thyroiditis is a, an inflammatory condition of the thyroid gland, typically associated with viral infection. The classical exam history refers to a tender goiter. When you hear the words tender, go tender goiter, you wanna be thinking about this condition. Now it's worth noting that I've mentioned the word acute in this slide and in this bullet point. That's because De Quiven's subacute thyroiditis follows a couple phases. The first or the acute phase is a state of hyperthyroidism. However, as time passes a couple of weeks later, the patient then enters a recovery phase. And in that phase, they then enter a state of hypothyroidism. So that's worth being aware of and, uh, and being able to distinguish those two differences. So moving on then, we're gonna talk about clinical features of hyperthyroidism. Now I want to go back to that brief slide of thyroid physiology that we mentioned. The important points that I raised was that the thyroid gland controls metabolism and metabolic rate. Now, the reason I draw back on this is because it's really easy to think of some natural uh, symptoms that a patient might present with as a consequence of their metabolic rate going up. So a patient may present with agitation, restlessness, a tremor, palpitations and anxiety. Now, all five of these features, uh, to me at least, make sense because you have this certain level of twitchiness, uh, increased stimulation of muscles of the heart muscle itself, giving the palpitations and the patients on edge with this excess state of thyroid hormone running around the body. You also have heat intolerance. So this means that patients with hyperthyroidism have a low tolerance to high heat meaning they feel uncomfortably warm or hot when other people don't. Weight loss is, again, quite a predictable feature. You, or you can, the way you can think about it is if a patient's metabolic rate is increasing, their energy demand is going up. If they're eating the same diet, they therefore has le have less uh, energy left over for deposition into fat or weight, and therefore they burn off their reserves, leading to weight loss. A goiter may or may not be present depending on the cause. We mentioned Graves' disease and the nodular uh, causes of hyperthyroidism may be relevant to that. And diarrhea and, and frequent bowel movements. Once again, if the GI tract has increased activity and for all intents and purposes, more energy provided to it, 
it's going to be working harder and faster. And so food and dietary products will move through the GI tract at a faster rate than they otherwise would. And that results in a low transit time or a short transit time and therefore diarrhea. And a similar principle underpins menstrual changes, namely oligo and amenorrhea, meaning shortening and uh, infrequency of periods all the way up to amenorrhea, meaning no periods at all. We also mentioned Graves' disease as a specific cause of hyperthyroidism. So there are a couple of clinical features that when you read in a history, you should be thinking is pointing to this direction. Exophthalmos, so exo means outwards, and that's, this is basically protrusion of the eyeballs in, within the orbit. You have lid retraction, which enhances this uh, visual appearance of bulging eyes. Restricted eye movements, lid lag, which is uh, often found on examination. So you ask the patient to hold their head still using a finger or the end of a pen in front of them. You ask them to track the pen. And what you would expect to notice if someone has a lid lag is their eye is able to follow the pen well, but the lids lag behind, leaving this bit gap of white above. Thyroid acropatchy is often referred to or compared to digital clubbing. Uh, Although it may appear similar, it's not necessarily um, the same phenomenon. So thyroid acropatchy is actually due to periosteal uh, phalangeal bone overgrowth. But you can see this area of erythe erythema uh, clubbing of the nails and you get swelling and uh, almost edema of the fingers themselves. Pretibial myxedema is another sign. So on examination of a patient's legs, you may note pretibial myxedema. And this is induration, waxy, and discoloration of the skin of the legs. And finally, you have proximal myopathy, which refers to a special test in which um, a patient may have difficulty using their proximal limbs and the muscles involved in those movements. You can also have a palpable thrill or a brewery. Uh, again, if you see that in a history, um, you want to be thinking about Graves' disease. Now, I was trying to provide uh, a picture for the slides of a patient with some of these classical features and I'm quite a visual learner myself and I, I struggled to do so. So I actually came up with a little schematic myself. Now this isn't to say that all patients with hyperthyroidism look like this lady uh, or indeed have all of these features but if you're a visual learner you may benefit from from keeping this in your mind. Okay so how would we examine and furthermore manage these patients then? So when we think about investigating a patient, before we talk about the cases of thyroid disease, I'd like to just mention a little bit of a framework that I like to adopt when thinking about investigation. Now, everyone has their own way of doing things, and mine isn't perfect by any means, but it's pretty good at creating a comprehensive review um, or a comprehensive list of investigations you'd like to uh, request. So I like to think of them following the order of bedside, bloods, secretions, imaging, and other. So at the bedside for this lady, you'd want to do some vital signs. You'd want her ECG. This lady may report palpitations. She may feel her heart's racing. She may feel on edge. All of these may point towards tachycardia. They could point towards an arrhythmia. Uh, and in general terms of a wellness check, it would be sensible to see how she's doing. When we think about bloods, you want to screen for differentials. Now, TFTs are, of course, the important part of this list. Um, you can distinguish a patient having primary and secondary thyroid disease in their TFTs. So if their TFTs are high, demonstrating hyperthyroidism, you then want to be aware of their TSH levels. If their TSH levels were high as well, that would indicate that a secondary cause of disease, and that's because your TSH is working hard to stimulate the gland. If your TSH levels were low, however, that would indicate a primary cause of disease. And that can be thought of as the gland working hard on its own, even though no one's poking it to do so. TSIs, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, are a blood test specific to Graves' disease. And that's a marker of these antibodies within the blood that bind to the gland and result in increased thyroid secretion. Secretions aren't particularly relevant to this lady, but to maintain the framework, I pop them in there. And when we're imaging, you need to be aware of your differentials and what you're concerned about and what you're expecting. If a patient has a suspicious neck lump or a nodule and you want to kind of find out a little bit more about it, imaging is a great idea. 
an ultrasound might be the first port of call. Uh, and you can also think about a thyroid radioiodine uptake scan. So this is a scan where radio labeled iodine is inserted into the body and you track it uh, in particular by looking at the thyroid activity. Now iodine is used in thyroid hormone synthesis. And so what we expect is to be able to see roughly where that iodine is utilized strongest. And there are a couple of patterns to be aware of. I'm not quite sure if you, you would expect to be examined on them, but they're quite interesting pictures nonetheless. So at the top here, we've got Graves' disease. Now, this is a diffuse, dark uptake of iodine. For context and for reference, a normal thyroid would have a pale gray color, uh, and this is much considerably darker than you'd expect. And note how it's diffuse, so the whole gland is lighting up dark, an oxymoron, but nonetheless. A toxic multi-nodular goiter is a condition of multiple nodules, as we mentioned. And so as you might expect, you can see these multiple hotspots of thyroid uptake. You can make out these little blobs and there's more than one. In fact, there's probably four to five in that gland alone. And that's a marker of uh, toxic multinodular goiter. And finally, following the classical story, a toxic adenoma has one single focal uh, hotspot of iodine uptake. If you have a nodule you're worried about, if a patient has worrying signs, you need to be aware of the possibility that a patient might have thyroid cancer. And now, although they're not touched upon in this talk, they're quite an important topic. They can cause quite a little, quite a bit of confusion as well. If you're worried about a patient and they have a nodule, it might be worth biopsying. And so management. Again, similarly talking about frameworks, I like to think about my management in a couple of steps. You can use, cons you can use symptomatic measures. So that's uh, measures which will help that patient there and then. You can use conservative measures, things that the patient can do on their own that don't require medication nor surgery um, and will help in the long run. You can offer medical management and you can offer surgical management. So in the symptomatic context, a beta blocker can offer rapid control of a patient's symptoms if they have hyperthyroidism. Now it's by no means a cure and it's not necessarily ideal in the long run. However, if they're experiencing awfully unpleasant symptoms, it's worth thinking about. In terms of medical management, these two drugs are antithyroid medications, carbimazole and propylthiouracil. Now carbimazole is probably used a little bit more commonly uh, and at least in an exam context, propylthiouracil is particularly favored in uh, pregnant ladies. And it's worth being aware of the two names. Finally, you can have surgical management. Now, radio iodine therapy almost plays upon the same principles that underpin the thyroid radio iodine uptake scan. You inject a patient with uh, radio label labeled iodine. However, it's uh, got the destructive potential. So when these cells take up this iodine, it actually leads to degenerative changes, oxidative stress, and leads to cell death. A thyroidectomy, as it sounds, is a surgical approach where you remove either part or the whole uh, thyroid gland. Obviously, those patients, especially if you were to remove their whole gland, you need to be aware that they have, they're going to have a thyroid requirement. Okay, so moving on to hypothyroidism then. What I'm basically going to do is flip that whole scenario on its head. Thy hypothyroidism refers to insufficient secretion of thyroid hormones from the gland. And there are, again, a number of causes to be aware of. The most common cause in the developed world is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto's thyroiditis accounts for two thirds of cases of hypothyroidism, and it's underpinned by inflammation secondary to autoantibody attack. These autoantibodies are more specifically autoantithyroid peroxidase antibodies. And over time, it leads to chronic inflammation and even fibrosis of the gland. You can also have an iodine deficiency. Now, this is much more common in the developing world. And in fact, it's the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the developing world. Primary atrophic hypothyroidism. So this is caused by diffuse lymphocytic infiltration of the gland, presents with hypothyroidism in the absence of a goiter. And that can sometimes be quite a classical uh, story to hear in exam questions. There is also the possibility of a cold nodule, meaning 
a nodule within the gland that lacks the ability to secrete thyroid hormone and therefore results in an overall decrease in thyroid hormone secretion from the gland. And once again, be aware of medications and surgery. So carbimazole and propylthiouracil, we just mentioned, are antithyroid medications. And we also mentioned surgery. By removing part of the gland, you have less ability and less capacity to secrete thyroid hormone, resulting in a reduction. And I mentioned earlier, amiodarone and lithium are commonly, cause, uh, are commonly thought of as causing hypothyroidism. So be aware. And finally, dequivins, uh, subacute thyroiditis. We mentioned previously in the recovery phase, patients see a state of hypothyroidism. So once again, going back to first principles and thinking about the function of the thyroid gland, clinical features are once again quite predictable. Patient might have lethargy and fatigue. They may have dry skin with the inability to retain the moisture in the skin. They may demonstrate pallor and thinning brittle hair with the loss of the outer third of the eyebrow. Now, all these features result from slow kind of skin turnover, slow hair turnover, resulting in poor health of the different organs and the different structures. Patients also demonstrate a cold intolerance. So this means that the patients feel uncomfortably cold when others feel comfortable. And weight gain. A patient's activity is low in its boots. Overall, that means they require less energy to perform their daily functions and systemic processes. However, on the same diet, they have more energy left over. And so that's deposited in, deposited in the form of fat and weight gain. Deepening and hoarse, hoarseness of the voice are common. And you may note a goiter. Once again, it's not specific. Low mood can be a common feature. And constipation with menorrhagia are both explained in reverse of what we were discussing in hyperthyroidism. The way you can think about it, if, if you like, is a patient with a low functioning thyroid have low energy levels, they have low moisture in the skin, they have low hair, meaning less hair, they have low temperature intolerance, a low voice, low bowel activity, and low libido. That might be helpful to think about. Once again, there's a little uh, cartoon to be aware of to demonstrate some of the common features of a patient with hypothyroidism. Disclaimer, once again, it's not representative of all, but it outlines some of the nice uh, clinical features quite nicely. So moving on then, thinking about how we're going to investigate this patient, it's very much a similar story. At the bedside, we want a set of vital signs. This time, instead of their heart racing, we might expect their heart to be on the slow slide. They might be bradycardic. Bloods are, uh, again, useful. And in particular, an FBC is quite important here. Now, in a patient with fatigue, low libido, poor hair health, dry skin and pallor, a very reasonable differential would be anemia. And so an FBC would help rule that out. Similarly, the TFTs might show you whether it's a primary or secondary cause. And anti-TPO are the antibodies uh, recognized in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Secretions, once again, aren't applicable to this lady. And imaging, you can, if you were to note a goiter or any abnormal nodules, you might choose to image. Just be aware that a radioiodine uptake scan is far less commonly used in hypothyroidism. It, it has the best results in a patient with hyperthyroidism. And management, if you have a concerning nodule, would be to get a biopsy and get a definitive diagnosis. The management of hypothyroidism is particularly easy. You want to replace the, the thyroid hormones that are deficient. And so you'd replace with, with levothyroxine. Just be aware that it's really simple. It fits all. And if a patient has low levels of thyroid uh, hormones due for other reasons, then this would be a great option. So we've talked about a spectrum of thyroid function and thyroid dysfunction, in fact. Now, at the extremes of either end of this spectrum lie thyroid emergencies. So you have a myxedema coma, an emergency of low thyroid function, and you have thyroid storm, an emergency of high thyroid function. So a myxedema coma is a life-threatening emergency. 
It's caused by severely low concentrations of uh, circulating thyroid hormone. And it typically presents in a patient with confusion, altered consciousness, hypothermia, and bradycardia. Now, confusion and altered consciousness are particularly nonspecific, as are the latter two um, features. However, in a patient with hypothermia and bradycardia, definitely think about whether this could be a mixed edema coma. Investigations, most importantly, is with an A2E assessment. This patient's in a life-threatening state. You need to start at the airway and correct any problems that uh, you come across in that order. TFTs may point to the diagnosis. However, they're more likely to come slightly later once you've at least stabilized this patient. And to manage your patient with, in mixed edema coma, you'd opt for IV fluids, IV thyroxine, and you'd opt to rewarm them as well. In contrast, thyroid storm is a life-threatening emergency of high concentrations of thyroid hormones. It typically presents with fever, tachycardia, confusion, nausea, vomiting, and you may also have a trigger of systemic illness, which may be alluded to in a history. Once again, you need to perform an A2E assessment of this patient. You need to look after them and stabilize them as best you can, and TFTs will be useful. And management is with the five Bs of uh, thyroid storm management. Now to remember all five Bs may be a little bit over scope of this lecture. However, it could also be a useful mnemonic for you. So B for block synthesis, and that's using thionamide, which is an antithyroid medication. Another B for block release, and that's with iodine, which I haven't seen a huge amount of use in clinical practice. But then again, my experience is quite small with thyroid storm. And so it's just to be aware of, but hence why it's not on the slide. Block T4 to T3 conversion is the third B. And that's with drug medications such as propylthiouracil, propanolol, a beta blocker, and steroids. The fourth B is beta blockers. And the fifth B is certainly above scope of this lecture. But for completeness, it's block enterohepatic circulation. And that's using a medication called cholestyramine. So moving on then to the second case of this lecture, we have another lady present to us, and this time it's with weight gain and tiredness. She's gained weight over the last six months despite going to the gym and despite dieting. And she's most more recently developed diabetes and hypertension. She's currently on me medications including metformin and ramipril, ma managing her diabetes and hypertension respectively, with no history of notes within the family. She's a non-smoker and non-drinker. And she's recently noticed she's passing urine more frequently, and she's also had some urogenital thrush. You decide to examine this lady, and on inspection, you note she's overweight, particularly centrally, meaning around the waist and the tummy. She's got a ruddy, ruddy complexion, some coarse hairs on her chin, an interscapular fat pad, meaning distribution of fat between the scapula of her back, and she's got dark purple striae on her abdomen. On palpation, you note her skin seems thin and she's got bruising of the arms. And auscultation, her heart sounds are normal, breath sounds are normal. And although her abdomen's distended, there's very little of else that's noteworthy. Percussion, nothing of note. And on special test, you ask her to stand up uh, from her chair with her arms crossed in front of her and she's unable to do so. So I'd like you to have a little think about what might be going on with that lady. And in the meantime, we're just going to quickly discuss some adrenal gland uh, pathology, well, physiology, in fact. So the adrenal glands are a pair of glands that sit on top of the kidneys. They're located uh, at the superior poles. And they're comprised of a medulla, which is responsible for secretion of catecholamines. And then you also have a cortex. Now, the cortex has three key functions and three key um, areas. The zona glomerulosa is responsible for cortisol secretion. You have the zona fasciculata, responsible for aldosterone secretion, and the zona reticularis, responsible for the secretion of sex hormones. Now the adrenal glands themselves function once again on a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. You have CRH being secreted from the hypothalamus, which acts on the anterior pituitary to secrete ACTH, 
and that leads to stimulation of the adrenal glands. Be aware of the RAS, um, the renin, uh, angiotensin, aldosterone system, which is responsible for aldosterone secretion. And it all uh, focuses around renal perfusion and or hypoperfusion and the ability to activate this system to retain fluid and to maintain blood pressure. So Cushing syndrome then. Cushing syndrome refers to a state of chronic glucocorticoid, more specifically cortisol excess within the, with a loss of normal feedback system. So that's really important. It's a state of excess cortisol. Now, when we think about the causes, uh, we'll discuss a couple of which, some are ACT dependent, and that includes Cushing's disease and ectopic ACTH production. Now, I emphasize Cushing's syndrome is a state of cortisol excess because Cushing's disease is indeed something slightly different. Cushing's disease is a state of Cushing syndrome, meaning there's excess cortisol. However, the cause is specific, and that cause is an ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma, meaning there's a, a mass in the pituitary gland which secretes ACTH, leading to excess cortisol secretion. Over time, that increased ACTH will lead to adrenal gland hyperstimulation and hyperplasia. Ectopic ACTH production is often alluded to and seen in patients with small cell lung cancer and carcinoid syndromes. It's a great differential to consider in your more obscure histories, especially in an exam setting. However, it's probably less likely. You also then have ACTH dependent causes, excuse me, independent causes. And these are causes of cortisol hypersecretion despite uh, normal ACTH levels. And these are typically due to disorders of the adrenal gland themselves, particularly an adrenal adenoma or an adrenal carcinoma. You can also have a patient with cortisol excess secondary to iatrogenic causes. And these are patients on long-term steroids. So when we think about a patient with Cushing syndrome, there are a number of features to be aware of. Spiny or bony tenderness, weight gain, easy bruising, diabetes, interscapular fat pad distribution, striae, hypertension, and then other features include moon face, low mood and depression, hirsutism, and amenorrhea. Now I've gone through those very quickly, and that's because there's an acronym for at least the first few and that's the acronym Swedish. So if you take a look at the first letters, you have spinal tenderness, weight gain, easy bruising, diabetes, interscapular fat, striae, and hypertension. And although the other features don't quite fit the acronym, they're also very classical and very important to be aware of. Once again, there's little drawing just to jog a few, a few memories and, and to help you remember some features. Same disclaimer as before, it's not quite representative of all, but it's a good idea of a classical story. So how are we gonna manage this patient? Well, we need to do a set of vital signs on them. You'd expect them to have hypertension based on the classical story of Cushing's disease. You'd also expect their blood glucose to be high. When you do bloods, you want to look at an FBC, CRP, use knees, LFTs. Their plasma cortisol, you would expect to be high. Now, the thing I want you to be aware of, however, is cortisol levels fluctuate throughout the day. They're highest in the morning and they're particularly uh, kind of unpredictable. And so you can't rule out or rule in Cushing's based on cortisol alone. Also just be aware of an it classical ABG finding of a patient with Cushing's, and that would be a hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. Secretions aren't particularly relevant. You may be able to reaffirm a suspicion of diabetes with a urine dip, but that wouldn't be specific to Cushing itself. Imaging, you might consider a CT of the adrenal glands or an MRI of the pituitary. And other is actually the most important test here. And these are your dexamethasone suppression tests. So what these tests base, are based upon is the ability of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis to secrete cortisol and the ability of the body or exogenous sources of steroid to suppress this system. So the low dose dexamethasone suppression test, you give a low dose of 
uh, oral dexamethasone at midnight. The next morning, you would test their cortisol levels and you'd want to look whether that feedback system is intact or not. If a patient has suppression of the system, you'd, that would be a normal finding. If they don't have suppression of the system, that would demonstrate Cushing's syndrome, this state of cortisol excess. Now, if you then went and gave this patient a high dose dexamethasone suppression test, you would then give a higher dose over 48 hours and assess their cortisol levels once again. If at this point they have suppression of the adrenal axis, that would demonstrate Cushing's disease, meaning it requires a lot of ACTH, but the ACTH feedback system is still intact at some level. If a patient has no suppression, despite giving a big dose of ACTH, you then need to be thinking about uh, independent causes. And that might be with ectopic ACTH secretion, demonstrated by high levels of ACTH, or it might be due to adrenal pathology. And that would be classically presenting with low levels of ACTH. The management of a patient with Cushing's depends on the cause. And this is where I've dropped the framework for just a moment to make it absolutely clear uh, how we would manage different cases. If a patient has iatrogenic Cushing syndrome, meaning they're on long doses of, they're on high doses of steroids for long periods of time, you might want to consider, is it possible to stop this medication? Is it possible to reduce the dose? Or is it an unavoidable risk that we just have to live with? If they have Cushing's disease, meaning a pituitary tumor that secretes ACTH, you want to remove that tumor. And that would be with surgery via a transsphenoidal approach. And if a patient has an adrenal adenoma or carcinoma, you would opt for an adrenalectomy. If a carcinoma, you can also offer adjuvant, meaning complementary therapy. And that would be with adrenalytic medications such as mitotane. And finally, if a patient has ACTH secretion from an ectopic source, you want, you'd be worried about uh, cancer, whether that be small cell lung cancer or carcinoid syndrome. And you need to manage these patients with thorough investigation, a thorough screen. And if there is indeed cancer, they would then go down a different pathway for management. And the final topic of adrenal uh, pathology that we're going to talk about tonight is adrenal insufficiency. So that's impairment of the adrenal cortex to secrete cortisol and aldosterone. Causes may be primary or secondary. Primary causes include Addison's disease, which is the most common cause of adrenal insufficiency. And it accounts for about 80% of cases. And it's underpinned by autoimmune destruction of the adrenal cortex. You do also have other causes of primary adrenal insufficiency. These are less common, but worth being aware of. And the secondary causes are most commonly due to iatrogenic or exogenous steroid use. Patients are often on steroids for a long period of time. And with this, their uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis uh, undergoes suppression. It's worth noting that these patients' adrenal state or state of adrenal insufficiency, excuse me, is only evident when they withdraw the steroids. Clinical features of adrenal insufficiency you have weight loss, you have hyperpigmentation, typically of the palmar creases or the buccal mucosa. You have nausea, vomiting, abdo pain, bowel changes, and also postural hypotension. And that might manifest with dizziness or faints. So here's a little schematic to think about this patient demonstrating some key features. Now, how can we tell if someone's got primary or secondary adrenal insufficiency? Well, there are certain tests you can do. However, it's actually possible to have at least some idea based on the clinical features. And that's more specifically looking at a patient's presence or absence of hyperpigmentation, at least in the context of an exam question. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is underpinned by dysfunction of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And that results in reduced levels of ACTH. In contrast, Adrenal insufficiency in the primary state is due to failure of the gland, and so you'd get compensatory high levels of ACTH. Now, to be able to understand why someone might have hyperpigmentation, you need to go back a step. ACTH is derived from a molecule called pro 
opiomelanocortin. And this is a precursor for melanocyte, stim melanocyte stimulating hormone. And when compensating, the body produces increased levels of POMC in order to meet the increased demand for ACTH. And so as a consequence, you have increased levels of MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. So how do we manage these patients and how do we investigate them first? Well, we need to think about the bedside. Their vital signs are important. In particular, you may expect to see their evidence of postural hypertension. Bloods include FPC, CRP, use knees and LFTs, particularly useful for assessing a patient's differentials, especially if they're hyperpigmented, you might be concerned about liver disease or some sort of hemolytic state. Imaging and secretions aren't particularly relevant in this case. And in terms of other tests, the diagnostic test is with the synactin test. Syn, coming from the word synthetic in this context, and actin, A-C-T-H, actin. So synthetic ACTH test effectively. And this is where you give a patient synthetic ACTH via an IM injection. And you basically pose the question as to whether or not their adrenal glands are able to respond to this increased level of ACTH. So therefore you're asking the question, is the disorder within the gland itself or is it higher up in that the gland's not getting any chemical messengers to secrete the hormones? If a patient lacks the ability to secrete the hormones despite given synthetic ACTH, this is indicative of Addison's disease. And management of this condition, well, it's simply put, similarly to hypothyroidism, you need to replace the deficiencies. In a more conservative approach, you need to consider regular review and blood tests. And in the medical setting, you need to give hydrocortisone to replace the glucocorticoid loss, and that's to replace your cortisol. And you need to give fludrocortisone to replace the aldosterone losses. So the final touch uh, point to touch upon is Addisonian crisis. So Addisonian crisis is a life-threatening emergency of cortisol and to a lesser extent, aldosterone secretion. Um, the classical picture would be a patient who's known to have Addison's disease or who has uh, regular and long-term steroid therapy, who's at risk of forgetting their medication. And it's often preceded by a trigger such as um, infection, trauma, or surgery. Clinical features are often um, non-specific, and that would include uh, tachycardia, hypotension, oligurea. Uh, you may see weakness, altered GCS, and confusion, and there may also be abdominal signs such as nausea, vomiting, or bowel changes. Now, you need to think about how to investigate this patient, and once again, any crisis or emergency go back to your A to E framework and you can't go far wrong. You're going to correct any problems you see as and when you come to them. And that would include vital signs as part of that assessment. Bloods need to be fairly non-specific and rule out a large number of uh, life-threatening causes. Cultures would be sensible in case this patient was septic and their cortisol, aldosterone to renin ratio and an ABG may give a more definitive uh, outlook. The ABG classically shows a hyperkalemic metabolic acidosis. And so just to touch upon that, aldosterone's function is to retain sodium, which in turn draws water into the uh, lumen of the vessel. Now, if you have Addison's and you have no uh, aldosterone, what that means is that you'll in fact have low levels of, uh, you'll have low levels of sodium and therefore the sodium potassium pump would therefore mean that you'd have high levels of potassium. Secretions and imaging and other aren't particularly relevant in this emergency state. Management A to E is an assessment and a management in itself. You need to give IV hydrocortisone with IV fluids and you may consider fludrocortisone. Now the reason you may consider that is because IV hydrocortisone has sufficient mineralocorticoid potential to cover the patient in that acute state. Okay, so what we're gonna do then is move on to a couple of questions. There's just a handful of uh, questions to go through, multiple choices, just to try and reaffirm some of the um, 
topics discussed in the lecture. So hopefully we're going to have a poll. So it's an anonymous poll, feel free to vote and take a moment to have a little look at what you think about this question. So is the poll up, yeah? It is for me, I hope so for everyone else. If you guys can see. Yeah, it. there we go, I've got some responses. Okay, there's. So give it a couple yeah, seconds. You, you okay, so having a little look at the answers we've got at the moment, then we have the majority of people are opting for B, which is a goiter. We have a couple answers for C, lid lag, and a couple answers for D, thyroid acropatchy. Now, the question isn't particularly kind because it's a negative question. The answer is, in fact, B, which is a goiter. Now, the thing to stress about a goiter is a goiter isn't specific to hyper or hypothyroidism, and it's even less specific to the causes of each. All the other features are consistent with um, Graves' disease. And the way you can think about that is any eye sign in context of thyroid disease can be th thought of as indicative of Graves. Now, an interesting point just to mention quickly is smoking itself is of course, bad for anyone's health. But in the context of thyroid disease, it's particularly awful for a patient's eye disease. So if a patient has thyroid disease with eye signs, smoking poses a serious risk to their eyesight and it, you need to counsel them on how to stop. Now, question two is a question about the five Bs of thyroid storm management. This question won't have a poll. It's the only one that's not multiple choice. So just take a moment, whether you're sat alone to make a note on your pen and paper or chat to a friend, um, just to kind of confirm your answers out loud so you can't change them. But just see if you can recall some of the five Bs of thyroid storm management. I'll just give it 20 to 30 seconds. Okay, so it's quite a tricky question, as I mentioned. It's probably more important to think of the drug, but if you're someone who likes to have the wider context to help your memory, then that's where the five Bs may come in useful. The first one is to block synthesis. The second to block release. The third to block conversion from T4 to T3. The fourth was a beta blocker. And the fifth was that slightly peculiar and uh, quite complex topic of blocking enterohepatic circulation. And then the second question is think of some medications for each. Well, to block synthesis, we'd go for an antithyroid medication of thionamide. To block the release, we mentioned iodine. To block T4 to T3 conversion, we mentioned antithyroid drugs, beta blockers and steroids, which is where your beta blocker comes in, as well as being useful for symptomatic treatment. And finally, cholestyramine was that slightly peculiar drug used to block enterohepatic circulation. So here we have the third question, multiple choice once again. Which of the following most strongly supports a diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis? And once again, we'll have a quick poll just for an anonymous uh, take of votes, just see what people's thoughts are. Just give it a couple seconds for any final votes. Great, okay. So the majority of people went right. The answer is indeed B, it's anti-TPO antibodies. Now, B is the right answer because we mentioned those antibodies are specific to Hashimoto's disease. To talk about the other features, low T3 and T4 with a low TSH is an interesting one that actually represents secondary hypothyroidism. So the way to think about it is because there are low levels of TSH, that, chem that chemical uh, messenger that tells the thyroid to work, if there are low levels of that, well, that explains why the thyroid function is poor. And Hashimoto's disease isn't a disorder of the brain 
the hypothalamus or the pituitary. It's a disorder of the gland itself. So that doesn't fit the picture. Hair loss is a sim uh, symptom of hypothyroidism, but it's not specific. Any patient with hypothyroidism of any cause might have hair loss. We mentioned about a goiter already. And TSI is your Graves antibodies. As no one chose that option, uh, I'll, I hope and I'll assume that everyone remembered that from the last slide. So question four, the penultimate question, how would we interpret this patient's dexamethasone suppression test results uh, on a background of hypercortisolemia? So they have no suppression on low dose dexamethasone suppression, and they have high on, excuse me, and on high dose dexamethasone suppression test, they demonstrate suppression of their cortisol levels. So once again, we'll take a quick vote. This one's a little bit trickier. If you have photographic memory and you can remember the tree diagram, you'll probably be okay. Okay. Great. So everyone actually chose the same answer and everyone chose the right answer, which is really good to see. So if we just go back to that uh, flow chart, it is indeed Cushing's disease. This flow chart, although it's not particularly comprehensive, uh, it is so well, well suited to finals and to preparation years leading up to finals. Um, so as we see, if we go down this pathway, they had their low dose suppression test. It was it demonstrated no suppression, so you can confirm Cushing syndrome. Now you want to know what caused it. And at this point, they had suppression. So that's your Cushing's disease. Your final question then. So this is a question asking about uh, the immediate management of a patient with Addisonian crisis. So how would you like to manage this patient immediately? Once again, a couple seconds to answer. Perfect. So I, once again, everyone went for the same answer and everyone was correct. Any time you're worried about a patient's health, A to E assessment, correct the life threatening uh, problems first. So you start at the airway, then move to breathing, then circulation, then disability, and then exposure. And all those features together will at least keep a patient stable in the acute phase. Although a lot of those other options, or at least, excuse me, the top two, A and B are relevant, they're not as ideal as an A2E assessment initially. Great. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure to go over some of this endocrine uh, work with you all. Could I very uh, quickly ask that you scan that little QR code in the bottom right? It just offers the opportunity to offer me a little bit of feedback, just so I have an idea of how to improve the session in future. Any things you liked, any things you weren't so keen on, uh, it would mean a lot to me. And in the meantime, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, otherwise, thank you very much.